I'm Greg Wheatley, and my guest today on Inside Wheaton is Dr. Jeffrey Greenberg. Jeff is professor of geology here at Wheaton College, was a guest here uh, with us a number of months ago, and we enjoyed that, and uh, so he's back here again. Jeff, you're one of those uh, privileged <laughs> few, you know, and, uh, just kidding. Good to have you back. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. And actually, I uh, wanted to have you here this time to talk about something very specific about your work uh, with uh, sustainable water treatment. Now, this is going to be one of those conversations where I'm going to learn right along with our listeners because uh, you got to bring me up to speed. What is, what's the project you're involved in here? Well, it, it can be confusing. Um, I'll, I'll give you a brief run-up to how this happened. Uh, one day, and it's been probably four years ago now or something, we were visited in the science division by um, one of our trustees, Mac Earhart, who's into construction. And one of Mac's buddies from church is a fellow I knew fairly well, too, a, a Dr. Jack Schaefer, who's a, he's a Christian and he's a civil engineer, very accomplished. And Jack has for many years been involved in putting in water treatment systems that are not conventional treatment systems. And they're composed of open lagoons, actually. Hmm. Uh, the most amazing part is that nature does the vast majority of the work in treating the water so that it's no longer dangerous. Um, he came to us, and we knew he'd been doing this, because he'd never been able to really see this carried on into the developing world for poor people, essentially. For people in the world who oh, suffer greatly from all kinds of problems with water and sanitation, not just water. Water is a real big deal these days for yeah. people in the, uh, in, in the world of, of doing good things, bringing water. But you just can't bring water because it's not going to stay clean very long mm -hmm. if you don't team it with a sanitation project. So Jack was uh, coming to us and saying, here's something your students can be involved in. And initially, he was thinking about something we could do on campus, uh, outdoors, because these are outdoor facilities. Or he would also had some connection with Benedictine College or Benedictine University. Um, but he'd rather come to us first because we're, we're, we're Jack's buddies. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we sat and we listened and we brainstormed a little bit. And we came up with a plan to do uh, what Jack had been doing on a much smaller scale and allowing students to be involved in an educational research experience to take something that people really knew worked, first of all. It was wonderful because we weren't trying to uh, invent something without knowing that it was going to be functional and, and do the job it was supposed to do. So we set this thing up, and we brainstormed how to do it, making it out of uh, fish tanks and PVC pipe and little pumps and all kinds mm -hmm. of gizmos and gadgets, and eventually set it up over in the basement of Armberding, uh, the former lecture hall area underneath the lecture hall, and uh, ran experiments for two years, basically, um, running pure water through it and looking at what we would find out with the changes in pure water, nothing, of course, mm -hmm. and then taking what we called a soup, a nutrient spike, and running that through there and seeing what happens to the water when you put nutrients in it. And um, finally was to add a honest-to-goodness chunk of sewage. Now, I don't want to say chunk, really. It's, well, it's mostly liquid. Mm -hmm. But we got that from the, uh, from the local sanitation district here. And we put that in as a spike. And the idea is of a spike with the nutrient soup is that you're going to grow lots of obnoxious things in there just like you would expect mm -hmm. in sewage. Uh, and then to prove with the right types of uh, processing that we were going to do that we could actually diminish or de disinfect the problems with that water. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did that. It takes a long amount of time. Students have to spend time there with the, with the apparatus and um, the variables that are involved in this thing. Eventually, you're using things like sunshine and regular atmospheric oxygen to break down the uh, pathogens that are in the, in the sewage. But you also use time because there's a lot of chemical reactions going on. And we also added algae because the algae do something as well. And what we do to test this system is we do a um, collection of data called BOD, which is biological or biochemical oxygen demand. 
and it's a little bit tricky. I don't want to go into explain it. And it's not a direct analysis of how much uh, bad bacteria, bad microbes there are, but it's an indirect measure of the amount of oxygen in the system that's also uh, a really good idea of what's happening in the water overall. And this is sort of a universal analytical tool that's used for testing water. There's other things you can do, too. You can do tests to find out if you have coliform bacteria in there, and we did some of that. But mostly it was these BOD tests. And the, the unique thing about Jack's system, well, it is a unique thing, really, is at both ends of the system, the first part of the system, I'll use my hands or something, first part of the system is a deep vessel, mm-hmm. fairly narrow relative to how deep it is. And the sewage water goes into it first. It comes into it from the bottom. Most of whatever larger particulate matters are in there go to the bottom and sort of settle out. And then the rest of the column will fill up with this water. Now, it's going to have to sit there. You need a detention time or a residence time, um, upwards of nine days, sometimes only five days. And what that does is the water becomes stratified so that the really bad anaerobic stuff, the stuff that doesn't do well in the presence of oxygen, which is a lot of the really bad pathogens, sit down at the bottom of this thing, and they get digested through time by eating each other, partly. (laughs) Um, And that process will disinfect a lot of things just with time. So you wait that residence time, and then you draw the water off the top to send it into another vessel. And the next vessel, instead of being deep, is actually relatively shallow and wide because now you're using the atmospheric surface Mm -hmm. and lights, uh, mimicking sunlight in this case, to sit down there and use UV radiation and use oxygen from the atmosphere to destroy what wasn't killed in the first vessel. And then you don't have to, but you have a a third vessel, which is Jack's way, Jack Schaefer, Dr. Schaefer's way, of taking this, uh, this water and let it be stored because at the end of the process, it has no microbes essentially, but it's loaded with nutrients. Hmm. So instead of doing like traditional conventional systems do where they take it and they put it into a stream, they put it into a lake, you take it and you spray it on crops and you use it as natural fertilizer. Hmm. So you recycle the water in the natural way, God's way, if you want to think of it just like rainfall, Mm -hmm. and you use the nutrients that are in the sewage that we've added in through everything in our household or our domestic uses, and you use that to help fertilize crops, which cuts down on the use of having to put new fertilizer on it and also, again, saves the water as well. Interesting. And these are ponds. And when you see these things, you see Jack's developments, you see these things as ponds. Hmm. Now, help me out here, Jeff. Mm -hmm. How... How would a system like that differ from a normal, let's, we live in Wheaton, so right. I pay my bill to the Wheaton Sanitary District to do this stuff. What, how's it different? Okay. Well, the traditional system, the conventional one we have now, and, and they have some variations and they can get fancier, but the real basic system is they'll have incoming sewage and sometimes they'll mix both the storm water and the, and the domestic water sewage. Those are sometimes they're, they're two different mm-hmm. streams, but a lot of times they'll be mixed. And when they'll do, they'll have a way of blocking large stuff that gets caught coming through and, and maybe even chopping it up into smaller pieces. So they want to keep really big stuff out. Then the stuff will go into an initial vessel of some kind, and settling will be taking place, and uh, they'll still have a problem ultimately with what we call sludge, the more uh, more solid materials mm-hmm. eventually. But the water then is taken from a first vessel, and very often it's sprinkled on a, um, a large oh, circular base of rocks that have algae and and other uh, organisms on them. It looks like really stinky rocks. Mm -hmm. And you see these these twirling blades that they have which sprinkles the water on there. Now, that partly aerates the sewage, but it also allows the bacteria that's on the water to help break it down. So that's the secondary sort of aspect of the treatment. And the third treatment, in most cases for our domestic use, is actually chemical. That's when they chlorinate the water Mm -hmm. as well. And you can look and see what the changes are in the water all along the system. The first part of what they do in most of these treatment systems really doesn't change much. Second part has a big role to play in getting rid of bacteria, viruses, microbes. And then finally, whatever's left over 
supposed to be knocked off by the chlorine that we add mm. to it. And then when we're finished with that water, um, very often that water is going to be, well, sent away to a creek, to a lake. It could be used, but still quality-wise, it may not be directly palatable for us, potable water. And uh, um, a lot of time you won't be using that water again directly. You'll be using your own well water or like we do here, Lake Michigan water. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So we're recycling the water, but not in a natural not directly. way. directly. That's right. Yeah. And these plants, and they add fancier aspects to them too as well. There's different sorts of steps in between. These are really very large. They're very expensive. They're difficult to maintain. And one of Jack Schaefer's uh, zealous points about his system is much less expensive, does a, a, a better job and does the natural recycling using natural processes. Hmm. Hence, sustainable. That's what we mean by well, that. Well, especially we, we, for different parts of the world right, where people right. cannot afford high capital projects. Right. So tell me about, you've traveled uh, uh, extensively, I think, looking at some of these things. Mm-hmm. Put this into practical context for us. What what places would, oh, would benefit my. from this? And Well, that's a very good question because one of the things we want to do with what the students have learned in one of our final products, once we get past the next stage, God willing, because we're trying to raise funds to go beyond, is to uh, produce a guide for people in surveying areas to figure out if they could use one of these types Mm -hmm. of systems. It won't be amenable everywhere. If you don't have enough water flowing in your community, you don't need a system. You can just use drain away latrines for each of the individual houses. If you do have enough houses, they still have to be closer together so you can collect it all and send a stream to the system. If they're too dispersed, you can't do it. So we have to look at the land. We have to look at uh, all the natural conditions of rainfall and climate. If it's an extremely rainy area, it means you're going to have to build it differently and it's going to be tougher. Uh, We're actually working on our next stage, which would be to build an outdoor structure like this. Uh, at a partner university in South Florida, Ave Maria, which is a Catholic school. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of a neat idea to see the Protestant week and coming together with Catholic Mm -hmm. Ave Maria and partnering on doing something for the developing world. But every single place in the world you'd have to go to, you'd have to survey, collect information, do research on that community and find out if it's amenable. Mm -hmm. And that's just the physical stuff aside from the politics, the economics, the culture, all the other sides that make projects either sustainable or not sustainable. And this, as you alluded to in the, in the beginning, uh, the whole issue of water is becoming really vital, isn't it? I mean, uh, I'm hearing that, you mm-hmm. know, that, that mm-hmm. this is this yeah. is a big problem in certain parts of the world. Yeah, and including the U.S. now, too, if you're out west, hmm. you know, we... Yeah. Uh, we're, we're managing somehow, but it's getting more and more difficult all the time. Uh, climate change issues, and the most amazing thing about climate change is we can't predict where and when things are going to happen. It's not this continuous heating that's the big problem. It's actually all the fluctuations and natural patterns of the weather that people get used to. Developing parts of the world, if you look at... Uh, sub-equatorial regions north and south of the equator, very often you're going to get two wet seasons. Mm -hmm. And people depend on those things to come through. And many places in the world are finding that they they don't come at the right time or there's only one or they don't come at all. And it's getting to be more and more of an issue, more and more of a concern. So water for people, water for irrigation, water for all kinds of domestic uses, absolutely essential, as everybody should realize. We take it for granted here because we're, we're wet. We're well off. Right. Uh, but a lot of places in the world aren't, and they're getting drier, some of them. Hmm. The uh, sub-Saharan Africa, the Sahel region in there, is continuing to get into worse and worse shape as far as rainfall is concerned. And we're talking about many millions and millions of people. So if there's the threat to the water and then the the threat to the sanitation is also because of infrastructure, capital, uh, political turmoil, all kinds of things. And even the places that have enough water, if you look at something like, um, well, Central America – uh, the Philippines and places where they have actually a lot of water, but the water is badly contaminated. And where I've been working on some of my s- student research uh, in uh, Eastern Europe in Kosovo, which was the former Yugoslavia, mm-hmm. working in there, they, they have a lot of water. It's a wonderful little place. It reminds me a little bit of the Appalachians. It's beautiful. Mm-hmm. And all of their water is contaminated. All their wells, all their mm-hmm. streams, 
they don't have a solid waste or a sewage waste management program at all. And it's dreadful to see how much water they have and they can't use because it's basically, you know, to us it would be totally poisonous. Yeah. They drink it, and they're just waiting for what happened down in Haiti for some real bad microbe to come in there, and then they'll end up with a disaster and wipe out half the people. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it's a big deal. Say a little bit, Jeff, about how this interfaces then. I mean, this is a human need, and, right. and any school could be working on this. Mm -hmm. There's a unique sense in which a Wheaton College uh, or many other Christian colleges have have reason to do this. That's uh, right. Talk, talk a little bit about that component. Of well, we're subversive, of course, <laughs> in a very good sort of a way. Yeah, yeah. But it, and it's amazing because we're working amongst in in Kosovo, for example. We're a community that's all the communities are ninety percent Muslim. There's the Orthodox Christians, which are mostly Serbian background there, mm -hmm. but most of these people are Albanians, and they come from Islamic backgrounds. Well, we go into this place as Christians. We're not. We're not holding back. We're not. We're not pretending to be somebody that we're not. And within a very short amount of time, we're, we're trying to work at a low level in villages and communities and schools. And right up front, we let them know who we are. Uh, we don't pretend. And then when they want to find out why we're there, which you can imagine, mm -hmm. uh, in this one village we've been working in, uh, we had a translator. And one of the guys in the village asked the, tr the translator, well, why are these people here? What's in it for them? This is about the second or third year we've been there. And our buddy translated from one of our other colleagues and said, um, they're here because they have something really good and they want to share it. And after three years, they're becoming friends with you all. You know them now. You know these guys. And they're not making a single penny off this. And their mouths started hanging open. Mm -hmm. Because they're not used to anybody who isn't on the take somehow. Yeah, right. You know, they were under a communism before that. The, the, the whole system is nobody really does a whole lot of things for other people, especially people that aren't part of their family or their community. And these crazy people coming from the U.S. Fortunately, in Kosovo, they love Americans right now because we're part of their saviors from the, the Serbians mm -hmm. previously. Yeah. But that could change at any moment. Mm -hmm. Our friends today could be our enemies tomorrow and, you know, politics gets in the way. But we go in, we tell them that we're there because we are people of faith. They're people of faith. And you can talk to them about faith. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of places in the Western developed world, you probably can't do that. Uh, they'd laugh at you mm -hmm. um, or you know, just basically turn off to what you want to say. But these people appreciate us. They're very family oriented and they're warm, wonderful. Most of the people I've, I've dealt with in other parts of the world, South Africa, Tanzania, Haiti, Brazil, wherever you are, you, you just fall in love with the local people. Mm -hmm. right. They're more relational than we are. They're, they're warmer. They've got more hospitality. And so we go in and we drink lots and lots of coffee and lots of tea <laughs> with these guys, get to know them as friends. And we have to work through our buddies who are locals, Christian locals. There's not a, there's not a lot of them in Kosovo. But they're the ones that do the translation, and they're the ones that build the respect and the trust. And we keep coming back. And you know, these guys are back again. Yeah. And they're cleaning our wells. We rehabilitate wells. That's one of the things I've been involved in for quite a while now with a group called Water for Life. But now we bring in this new context of the sanitation. And we'd like to bring this into Kosovo, but places like Haiti as well. Um, very simple to build. Virtually no working parts. Um, the ones in the world that have failed, and they do fail, have because they've been designed poorly or they haven't been maintained at the lowest level. But if local people buy into your project as partners, because you're not going to do something for somebody, you're going to be partners right. with them. Relationships are built. You go in and they learn everything that you know, and they'll know how to build them and hopefully to go out and multiply the, the blessings of this thing, and they'll know how to take care of them, and that will make it sustainable. <laughs> but it's Sustainability of projects is one of the most difficult things in the whole world right now. Yeah. Fascinating project, and uh, that's great Great to hear that Wheaton is part of this, and uh, God bless you as you keep going and doing that. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. We, we need it. <laughs> Jeff Greenberg is professor of geology, and um, I suppose, is there something on the web that would help people get to know this project a little more? Could we point uh, them somewhere? I do. Uh, yeah, I know we have a we have a Facebook page somewhere. Mm -hmm. I think it would be nice to get something more formally with the college. Um, we're almost a little bit of an orphan on this whole thing. We work on our own as far as raising funds and so on. So we're going out to foundations 
and to other donors and possibly things like Rotary Clubs hmm. that are very interested in this sort sure. of work right. and seeing if we can raise enough money. This is not very expensive to do, uh, especially the idea of traveling to other parts of the world and helping people survey. That's mm-hmm. pretty inexpensive. But to build what we want to do, what we call the phase two system down at Ave Maria is going to take some money because we have to have engineers involved in excavators. Once that's done, uh, our students, Ave Maria students, and other practitioners in international development can come and learn. And hopefully we'll use the Second Timothy 2.2 model of training trainers to go on and multiply the, the goodness. Yeah. You know? Great. So that's the big deal. Yeah. Yeah. Jeff, thank you so much. For Inside Wheaton, I'm Greg Wheatley.